It is Sunday night. Me and Dave are here. We are going to be talking to Kendall Phillips about none other than Kolchak and, and a lot of other horror Not stuff. Other but uh, yeah, no, intros in a second. Uh, let's play. Uh, Did that intro get stuck? What's going on? Hey, everybody. Once again, welcome to Late Late Horror Show. I am Dino, as always. Uh, and that is Dave, uh, vampire killer loose in Las Vegas. So, <laughs> And uh, Kendall Phillips is right below me. Um, before we introduce him, um, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. Uh, check out the link pinned to the chat where you can find his books. Uh, but yes, uh, we are going to talk about Kolchak. And somebody mentioned the stream last night. Yeah, that was pretty deep. Uh, thank you for all the comments there on that and everybody who joined. But let me say hi real quick to everybody. Sirs James, uh, CM, uh, Ed Stathis, Connie Clary, Lulu Bell, um, Harry Scott. What's going on? Edward Stewart. Everybody's here. Uh, Panic Penguin, John McKee. <laughs> Panic Penguin. Uh, Paul Ham, um, AI, no, Al Wizard uh, said he'll be right back. I hope he's back soon. He's going to miss everything. Uh, hey, Otamo, what's going on? Good to see you. But uh, here we go. I am going to throw this over to Dave Pluffet, and uh, he's going to introduce Kendall Phillips. And believe me, we've got plenty to talk about, not just Kolchak. We're going to talk about some uh, old, old school horror. And uh, I got a couple questions lined up, as does Dave. So, Dave, go ahead. Take it away. Right. First of all, <laughs> I want to thank Kendall so much for spending Sunday evening uh, with us at the Late Late Horror Show. Um, this is also Dr. Kendall Phillips. He is a professor at Syracuse University. And if you don't know where that is, it is in New York. It is also the home of or the alma mater of Dan Curtis. And uh, Kendall got his PhD from Pennsylvania University. He has a ton of books out, uh, including this one out here, Kolchak, The Night Stalker. Uh, he's also written a book on controversial cinema, the films that outraged America, A Place of Darkness, the rhetoric of horror in early American cinema, projected fears, horror films in American culture, and... He also saw Pantera when he when in, it was a cover band. Did, uh, how did you know that? That is absolutely true. Because it was on your rate right, your professor. Pantera was a cover band. You know, so, I did not even know that. So there is a club called the Electric Company in North Texas, just north of Dallas. And oh. I still distinctly remember this is pre Cowboys from Hell. So this is spandex and big <laughs> hair and Bon Jovi covers. And I remember periodically yeah. going to the bathroom and they would all be in there. I don't know what they were doing. I don't want to find out. I expect something I don't want to know. Uh, and I can and I always. Uh, so, so then years later, I see some kid come into my college classroom with Cowboys from Hell, Pantera. And I thought I used to know a band called Pantera. And lo and behold, there you have it. Wow. A WTF horror and sci-fi, sweet indigo, what's going on? Um, it, does that take care of it, Dave? Do we jump right into it? We we do. I just have a couple of quick questions just to know Kendall a little bit better. Question one, Night Stalker or Night Strangler? I, I got to go with Night Stalker, although I really love uh, the love interest in Night Strangler. I think the, I think the dialogue and stuff is more is, is a lot of fun in Night Strangler. But I got to yeah. I got to go with the original, especially the opening of, of Night Stalker is just like cinematic brilliance. It is. It is. But Joanne Flug, quite the big. <laughs> Wish she had continued on to the series. But anyway, that's a, another conversation. A absolutely. I kind of agree with Kendall there. Uh, and, and before we do, uh, we I am going to touch on this, Paul McKee. Uh, I actually just bought the entire Kolchak series on DVD. Very underrated show. I don't think a very underrated show. I just think it's getting a little bit more recognition right now. And again, at the time, it was just one season. And it was one season because people just didn't pick up at, on it at the time. 
But um, we'll we'll touch on that. But go ahead, Dave. Continue. Yeah. And next week we're doing episode eight. Bad medicine is that? Yes. The one? All yes. Right. Yes. Um, next question: Basil Rathbone or Jeremy Brett? <laughs> oh, Basil Rathbone! Come on. Start. All right. Yeah. Perfect. You can stay. Yeah. And the sudden death: Johnny Depp or Jonathan Freed? We won't even go there. Yeah, I'm. I'm past. Oh, wait. Yes. I kind of knew that's where it was gonna go. Oh man, right. yeah, not even close. <laughs> and uh, Kendall is also uh, a good friend of my friend Matt Jarvis, who was on a few months ago. Um, Matt is teaching in Georgia right now, I believe, uh, Columbus State University, if I'm remembering everything correctly. But um, that's really cool. So thank you. When you first um, found out about Kolchak, I was reading your book. You were nine years old and you snuck downstairs. Is that true? So, th so it's, yeah, it's such a bizarre... So uh, honestly, I would say my life is defined largely by three late night programs. Um, PBS used to air a British block late at night on Fridays. I don't know if it was everywhere in Dallas they did that had all these British comedies like Black Adder and Red Dwarf and then had Doctor Who. So that was one of the things that warped my young mind. Late yeah. Night with David Letterman. I still remember the early days when it was like Harvey Picar and Fran Lebowitz and Howard Stern. And I thought that's what a city is supposed to be like. Oh my God. And then the other was CBS Late Night, which was where CBS just dumped all these reruns. Uh, I originally went to watch that as a young kid because there was a show uh, called The Avengers, which I, as a nine-year-old <laughs> Marvel kid, was convinced meant that there was a secret television show of one of my favorite comic books. So I snuck down well past my bedtime, like midnight or whatever, and then saw this British guy in a bowler and a, this woman in very tight leather pants that made me very confused yeah. as a young man. Uh, and that hooked me on late night television. So I started routinely sneaking down to watch Columbus. Barnaby Jones, and then one night on comes uh, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, and I was terrified and hooked at the same time. So it was that was my introduction, about 1978-79. Oh, and Ed remembers that as well. Good, Edward. I'm glad I'm not the only person who remembers the glory of CBS late night television back in the good old days. And everyone in the chat can also ask questions as well, and we'll we'll feed those in. Um, Dino, do you want to talk? Well. One of the cool things about being a college professor is sometimes you get to teach some really cool classes. And what classes have been your favorite in like the horror genre? So I always try and do something more specific. You certainly can just do a generic, like here's horror. Um, about a year or so ago, I did, I thought it was a very interesting class on the haunted house film, but the global haunted house. So we, we started the semester, half of it, we did like the iconic classes, classics like the Amityville Horror and The Haunting and things like that. But the second half, we started looking at um, films from other parts of the world. And I would recommend there's some great international. If you're, if you're not watching international horror movies right now, you're missing out. There's a great Iranian film called Under the Shadow. It's brilliant sort of riff on the, the Haunted House film from a kind of uh, Iranian perspective. There's one of my favorite films of the last decade is a Mexican film called Tigers Are Not Afraid uh, by Isa Lopez, who uh, coincidentally is the showrunner for the new season of True Detective, The Night Country with Jodie Foster. So Isa yeah. Lopez, if you like that series, go back and watch her uh, haunted neighborhood film, Tigers Are Not Afraid, absolutely, absolutely loved it. So the great thing about the horror genre is there's so many different ways to come at it. And for me, especially the last decade, suddenly everybody loves horror. Now I should say, when I started writing about horror about 25 years ago, <laughs> people looked at me funny, like what's wrong? Did Were you dropped on your head as a child? Um, right. But the last decade, it's suddenly really since Get Out, suddenly everybody, so I now I say I studied the horror film and people say, oh my God, I love this film, I love this film, I love this film. So it's it's been a much more exciting time. And it's more interesting yeah, I think, than my I think calculus. A big, yeah, I think a big resurgence with like A24 and Blumhouse uh, kind of just, you know, and then bringing back Halloween, even though there's issues with that franchise. But, you know, th there was a big kind of boom that happened with a lot of uh, smaller independent companies that kind of got everybody talking about horror films again, which which is a good thing. And um, I would say a lot of the uh, foreign horror right now is some of the best horror out there, too. I agree with you 100 percent. So, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I'll track it down if you've got your Netflix. I I, I highly recommend I that people it. have a chance. Subscribe to Shutter. I know most of us have too many streaming services, and that monthly charge yeah. gets a lot. But Shutter is doing a fabulous job, not only of, of curating great classic horrors, but of bringing together uh, a lot of great international right. stuff. And I love Paul. Yeah. Paul, the New Avengers. I loved that series. I, I actually, as a kid, I loved that series a little bit more than the classic Avengers. So Paul, you and I are on exactly the same uh, wavelength there. <laughs> Listen, Paul knows everything when it comes to horror. <laughs> he he should be writing a book or something. I don't know, but um, a favorite haunted house movie of all time. I mean, for me, I think I know where it all began, really, and, and all that. I I don't know if you agree with me, but I mean, does it get any better than the old dark house? Uh, <laughs> I love that. I love anything James Whale did. You know, he's yeah. one of my absolute favorites. Like just last semester, I showed uh, his Bride of Frankenstein. It was actually one of the most popular films in the class, and that's not always true. Young people don't always dig the 1930s stuff. Um, no, I absolutely love that. I, I love The Haunting, which is a British film, but still sort of fits in the broader American category. Um, yeah. I have a soft spot for Amityville Horror, I got to say. Really? Okay. <laughs> That's been the original '70s version. I mean, come on, it's 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 so yeah, over yeah. the top. It you is. Got, yeah, you got Margot Kidder in there. You've got <laughs> bleeding so walls, good. and so yeah, good. yeah, you know. You know, this is one of the things too that my mom actually would read me the Amityville Horror when it came out in paperback in the '70s. To and get you so, to sleep at night when you're a little the, child during the day. <laughs> you're reading, like, what are you reading, mom? Let me read it to you. And I think that's what got me into liking horror is you know, Flowers in the Attic, Amityville Horror, whatever the top paperback was on the rack at the grocery store that week. Yes, yes, that's nice. Hey, Kathy, what's going on? Good to see you. Um, and I just want to say I agree with Edward Stewart, the changeling. That's another great one. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very, oh, very yeah. scary. Well, well, I think Ed's uh, favorite one is The Exorcist, of course. But um, yeah. Uh, OK, well, I mean, Haunted House Films, listen, uh, I, I think we could have you back another time. We'll, we'll see how much time we have to uh, get into some of the old classics, because I'd like to talk some old horror with you. But I, I think the main thing everybody wants to hear about is Kolchak. So uh, let's talk about Kolchak. Like, where did the, what made you write the book? And I did ask you earlier, the, the book that you wrote is all encompassing, the TV series and everything. So tell me about your love for Kolchak. Where did it all, well, you just told us where it began, you know, as a child sneaking downstairs. But tell us a little bit about the book and how that happened and all that. Yeah, I mean, I think my love for Kolchak has been deep and sincere for a very long time since I was about you know eight or nine, um, and really, in some ways, the the writing the book kind of came from the book series. So, the the series is Wayne State University Press has a, a series called TV Milestones, uh, and it covers all genres of TV. So there's a, a there's a volume on the X Files, on Mash, on I Love Lucy, on you know anything you can imagine all about the most iconic, influential uh, television series in history, like those television series that kind of changed the game. And as I was looking at that, I, I, started, I saw, like I said, one on X-Files, one on Twin Peaks, and I thought, well, they are just the, you know, kind of descendants of the real. So I went and actually talked to the, the press there at Wayne State University, and I said, hey, have you all ever thought about doing something on Kolchak the Night Stalker? And they literally said, I've never heard of that before in my life. These were, these were TV people. Never heard of that series. I have no idea what you're talking about. They wow. said, but, you know, if you want to pitch it, go ahead. So I marshaled up my resources, uh, turned to, I got to give a plug to Mark Dewidziak's wonderful book. If, if, if people are real Night Stalker fans, you probably have an old or really overpriced uh, old copy of Mark's <laughs> uh, The Night Stalker Companion. Um, went through all that, wrote up a, 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 a proposal saying, look, it didn't last long. And the TV series never had good ratings, and there was a lot wrong with it. I'm sorry to say there's a lot wrong with the series, but the core idea is what led to your Buffy, your Supernatural, your X-Files, your et cetera, et cetera. And they bought it. And I, for me, writing the book was not trying to write the definitive history of the Night Stalker. Mark Dewidziak did that. I will, I will clean his <laughs> boots. I'm like, I'm a big fan of Mark's. Um, 
But I wanted to go out to the general audience, the kind of people that are not necessarily thinking of Cold Check, people who like horror or people like television who've maybe never heard of Cold Check. And I want them to understand that this is the series that was, and to Paul's point, Paul's in the chat talking about Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows was one of those atmospheric horror films. Cold Check pivoted that towards this idea of the monster hunter. And that was the game changer. Right. We had lots of series all the way back to the early days of television that were telling horror stories. But the idea of hooking the narrative onto a monster hunter, that was a kind of game changer, this occult or gothic detective. That's what led to all kinds of other things. And so that was really what the book was about, trying to sort of to, to carve Kolchak into the Mount Rushmore of television. You've got a great quote in the book. It says, in Kolchak, the monsters are real, they're threatening, and they're here. No, I, I love that, and I'm sure we'll talk about this more, but I, I think the other thing that for me as, as a person who primarily has written about horror film, and in fact, part of my reluctance of, of doing this book was I'm mainly a horror film guy. Like, So we want to talk horror films. I'm happy to go all the way back to 1896. I'm happy to play. That's my <laughs> comfort zone. That's where I live. Television is, is similar, but a little bit different. So I was a little bit like, eh, what are you going to do here? But one of the great things for me about the Kolchak series, especially when you think about it in that period of the, the early 1970s, which was a real heyday for the horror film, is that most horror, more television horror before Kolchak was set in, you know, um, some far off place like this foggy Collinsport in Maine, or it was a comedy. Kolchak took what was going on in horror films, which was very much real everyday horror, like bringing horror home, and did that for television. And I think that was really another thing that really shifted television horror in the 1970s. Is there a reason uh, that you think it didn't succeed at the time? I mean, honestly, I think I think there's a lot of internal problems, and I know this is probably blasphemy for people that. And again, <laughs> I love I love Kolchak. I have a deep, right. deep affection for it, but hmm. nobody here can tell me you watched the Sentry and thought, wow, those are great special effects, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, the, the rubber, big plastic uh, uh, crocodile head uh, that looked like it came right off of an Arby or something, uh, you know, didn't quite work. There, there was, I think there were issues of there not being continuity. There was issues of there not really being development. I think that's part of what uh, uh, Darren hmm. McGavin was frustrated by. I don't think ABC put a lot of money in it. Uh, it was, and it was also, I mean, just from a television standpoint, it bounced around Friday. First, they wanted to run it earlier. Then they decided it was too scary for kids. They pushed it to late. That lost audience. Then they moved it way up, where it was competing with Sanford and Son and Chico and the Man, that were massive, you know, kind of iconic yeah. sitcoms. So it just never really got a fair run. Um, I don't think it ever. I don't think. The, I don't think the television show was able to routinely capture the quality of the first two movies. There are certainly episodes in Kolchak, the series, that are great, but those first two TV movies, The Night Stalker and The Night Strangler, if the series had been able to kind of keep it at that level, I think we would have been talking about a much longer run. Yeah, I had presented to Dino when we first started covering the series that I wish they had done very much like Columbo did where they would come yeah. back with kind of this TV movie every three to four weeks. Mm -hmm. Because as we're moving through the series, those first few episodes, like the zombie or the werewolf, were could have been so much longer and better and the continuity better and all of that would have made some great made-for-TV film. No, and that was the original plans, as some folks may know. The original plan with Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson was they were they were going to keep you know periodically doing the TV movie following that that uh, kind of Columbo model, but then you know the network executives being as brilliant as they were, of course this was ABC always the perennial third uh, third in line, uh, you know run to the litter. Uh, they decided that it'd be better to go to a regular series, and I think uh, I think it was Paul made the point. It wasn't just the special effects. I mean, I can forget. Look, I'm a Doctor Who fan from like the Tom Baker era. I can forget oh, yeah. really bad <laughs> special effects with good stories or something interesting. Yeah. Kolchak eventually, especially you're getting the kind of the second half of the season, kind of just becomes here's a monster. Uh, here's another monster. Um, you know, there's not the kind of continuity, there's not the build, there's not the development. And so I think that eventually it exhausted Darren McGavin. 
it exhausted whatever the audience base was. So again, great idea. I love it, but I love it in spite of itself sometimes. Now, yeah. when they went to the series also, did they get rid of Richard Matheson? Yes, that's right. Yeah, Matheson only worked on the, the first two uh, TV movies. And so they pretty much dumped every damn Curtis as well. So all of them kind of got dumped out. They moved it into, uh, you know, a different production team. McGavin consistently had struggles with the producers. So they went through a couple of different showrunners. Um, you know, it just was not, I don't think it's what people, I don't think it's what McGavin or the core people thought was going to happen. I think they thought they were to keep the quality of the TV movies and the tightness of the scripts and the interesting ideas. And I think some of that was in the TV series, but it also just became monster of the week. Let's throw something in lots of different writers jumping in and out. McGavin would complain, yeah. that, you know, scripts would show up the day of a shoot, like the day of a scene, they'd say, Oh, here's the direction it's going to go. And so it didn't have that. I mean, again, you're not going to get many TV writers, the quality of Richard Matheson, but I think there was a big step down. And as the series went on, it just started to, to decline even further. Yeah. I think it, was, it sounds like it was bound to fail. Uh, just too many things just didn't align and people were given up and all of that good stuff. But like Attila says here, I think that's what the allure of Kolchak is today is you watch Kolchak for Kolchak, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it doesn't matter about all that cheesiness or, or bad special effects or even me and Dave, we've talked about some of the really good episodes where the con continuity, like you've talked about, it just doesn't line up. It's just, you go, okay, I, but I can put that aside and enjoy it for what it is, you know? Yeah, um, I, it's definitely McGavin's charm. So I'm with Attila. It, it is absolutely McGavin. It's always funny. He's always charming. Uh, he's always engaging. That said, you know, to your point, Dino, you know, that, that they all seem to have collective amnesia after every episode. <laughs> like no one remembers anything that happened before. Like uh, I just exactly. kind of does start to drive you nuts. <laughs> and I tell Dave all the time too, I go, the one thing I think uh, that they should have done more was have a little bit more interaction between him and Vincenzo. You know, there just wasn't enough of that, but that's just me. I, I really enjoyed that part of it. Right, Dave? <laughs> yes, Dino. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, Did you ever yeah, get a chance no. to, uh, to meet Darren McGavin or anyone from the series or movies? No, no, unfortunately. Although Dan Curtis was an alum of our university, but I never had a chance to meet any of those folks. So, but Yeah, lots of fighting, says Paul. Paul was there. He knows. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, Paul McGavin Paul. and Curtis fought on the production of The Night Strangler. <laughs> McGavin refused to work with Curtis again. Uh, unfortunately, McGavin, McGavin didn't. See, I mean, he's a lovely, wonderful actor, but he did not seem to get along with a lot of production. So there's a lot of stories of almost everything McGavin was involved with, with him having some uh, disagreements with folks. But uh, probably, probably very legitimate. But I would say, you know, to 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 continue see, singing Darren McGavin's praises, um, as many folks may know, you know, Kolchak's iconic uh, seersucker suit, the the straw hat. Uh, that really came from McGavin. The original plan for the TV movie, which is set in Las Vegas, for folks who haven't seen it, was for McGavin to be dressed more like a Las Vegas guy and with like Hawaiian shirts and like shorts and like, you know, living in the hot uh, weather. But McGavin remembered a line in the script that he was really a New York reporter who had his career had fizzled, ended up in Las Vegas, and was desperate to get that story that would get him back to New York. And so he wanted Kolchak to dress like a New York reporter from the early 1970s. So he, you know, in his mind, Kolchak didn't think of himself as a Las Vegas reporter. Kolchak was a New York reporter who was just waiting mm. to get back on the beat. And so he didn't want him to be embracing Las Vegas. He wanted him to stick out like a sore thumb. And I think that really was a part of what made Kolchak the character so iconic. Yeah. And um, I, Ed Staff. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dave. No, no. I, I was just saying, I'm still upset at the night uh, stalker for getting rid of Gail Foster at the end. That still bothers me. Oh, amen. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask as well, you, one of the movies that we've also recently learned about and watched is the Norlis tapes. Have you seen that? And, and do you like it just as well? 
I do. And it seems like it was teed up and again, was meant to be teed up as a similar sort of uh, series to Kolchak. The other one I just ran back across recently, uh, it's a little bit later, I'm going to say it's like 77, 78, was uh, a, there were two TV movies that were meant to be pilots. One was called The World of Darkness hmm. and the other was called The World Beyond. And they're about a guy um, who has a near-death experience, is dead for like two and a half minutes, comes back and can hear ghosts. And then he, get, he keeps ending up in these different kind of supernatural. And, and I had completely forgotten about watching that until I just happened to run across it mentioned somewhere. Um, but that's the great thing. You know, the, the 70s, we were talking about this earlier about how they don't make them like they used to. There was yeah. so many more kind of experimental, almost weird, you know, weird ideas like the Norlis tapes or Cold Jack or The World Beyond. There was just so much more creativity in the television movie uh, and I don't know that we have as much of that now. I feel I feel like now maybe things are a little more, I don't know, maybe driven by corporate decisions or something. But oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's corporate dri driven. I mean, everybody wants to, a remake, a reboot. Um, like I said, we've we talked about it. you got you got to go to uh, another country to get good horror because they're actually using their imagination and, and coming up with great ideas and stuff like that. But the corporations here, the big movie companies want to reboot everything, and I don't like it. But anyways, <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite Cold Chack episode out of all of them? Um, I, they're kind of, I mean, I, the zombie is without a doubt the scariest. Like, I don't think anybody who's watched Cold Chack can watch the, the, yeah. the the sewing scene and not and not start getting quivers uh, as it's starting. Um, but honestly, mm. one of my favorite, and it's going to be maybe an odd choice, is Horror in the Heights, um, mm -hmm. which is the it's a you know set in a Jewish neighborhood in uh, Chicago, but it's about a Hindu monster. And for some reason, there's just something about the way that episode weaves together. I just think it's it's very quintessential cold check. So I really I really that's that's the one. The other one I would say is the Devil's Platform. Um, cause I, that actually aired, I think just like two weeks after, uh, Nixon resigned. So it had to feel <laughs> the idea of a politician selling his soul to Satan must've felt fairly real to American audiences <laughs> right about then. I, I'm not sure it would, I'm not sure it's any less real now, to be honest, but that's a, a different topic. I guess. Right. So well, I'm I curious. Think, oh, yeah. go ahead, please. I, I was going to say, we just did the devil's platform a couple weeks ago and that it was terrific. I loved it. Yeah. So I was curious for I you guys, dance, what, what, what was it yeah. that brought you to Kolchak? Like, I, I love, the, I love this, uh, the show you guys do, and I love that you've been going through Kolchak, and, and I know Columbo and a lot of other great series. So what was, this, what was the instigator for saying, let's get Kolchak back on, on the people's radar here? <sighs> All right. So <laughs> as you heard, the Late Late Horror Show has been around for about eight years. And Dino had a partner for about six of those years named Ted, and they would talk about movies all the time. And they really broke down movies, terrific, and it was a lot of fun. And I mentioned that they should watch Kolchak, The Night Stalker, because they hadn't done it. Yeah. So a year would go by, and I'd mention it again and again <laughs> and again. And about two or three years ago, he, Dino and Ted finally went through and watched it. And Dino hadn't seen it before and loved it. Mm -hmm. And so um, from there, it's history. Yeah. yeah. And then he yeah. and I did the Night Strangler and we just decided we're going to go through mm -hmm. the, the 20 episodes because it's such a great, such a fun series to talk about. And I, we're surprised as well, I think, of how many people also think it's great that come out of the woodwork for this kind of, I don't want to call it iconic, but cult-like uh, TV show. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, taken on a cult like status, uh, uh, as well as a lot of people are really nostalgic for a lot of the old uh, made for TV horror movies like Gargoyles and um, Salem's Lot and stuff. Well, Salem's Lot always. I mean, come on, that's a Stephen King adaptation. So, uh, but Gargoyles. Um, the there's many of them. Of terror. Trilogy of Terror. There's another one. Yeah, yeah. Which, which I would ask, Kendall, uh, other than Kolchak, uh, you know, that's a series. Um, uh, any movies made in that era 
uh, that really, uh, you know, you love, you love like something like gargoyles or all of them. I mean, there's some of them were bad. But, you know. I mean, so I think I loved ABC night at the movies. It was that that's, that's part of what I was getting at earlier. You know, it's, it's like that space where people could throw up the weirdest idea. But let's, let's be honest. Gargoyle. I love gargoyle. I still yeah, have chills, yeah. but that, try and sell that to a network executive today. Right. Like, you know, I've got right. a great idea. It's in New Mexico and there are gargoyles living in a cave. It's going to be cool. Right. I, I don't think you're going to get that. So I love those. Um, oh, I it was so good the, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there were so many of those fun. Again, it was a great space for horror. And it was in that period where horror was so incredibly popular at the box office. So it's not surprising that the, you know, television executives would would want to would want to go that direction. But no, I mean obviously yeah, Gargoyles was it was a really big one. That like I said, that the world of darkness was another that I really remember. Um there's so many of those very strange, weird little films that either connected or changed things. Um Kill Dozer Eleven, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Paul and don't I be should afraid like of have the dark. Like... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't be afraid of the dark. Was another, I think, really, really uh, good made-for-TV movie. I, I think, I mean, just really, really good. When you see those little creatures, I mean, scared the heck out of me as a kid. That is something that stuck with me for sure. I, I've got one for you. Um, okay. And hello, Freddie Miranda. Um, Spectre, nineteen seventy-seven. Robert Culp. I don't know this one. No, you got me. All right. It is uh -huh. on YouTube. It is available and it is fantastic. It is along the same lines as the Norlis tapes and Kolchak. Oh, nice. And it is um, basically, I guess, this couple buying this estate. And little do they know there is satanic rites being done underneath the old home. And it's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Robert Culp is such a good actor anyway. <laughs> Always go. I got one. I got one more. I, I want to throw out. It's, it's sort of tangential, but the, I had a big impact on me as a kid. Mazes and monsters. This was an early Tom Hanks oh, movie yeah. about a yeah. kid playing Dungeons and Dragons and going crazy, which my parents <laughs> saw and were as convinced that my Dungeons and Dragons playing was going to drive me crazy. So I don't know if other folks uh, had uh, parent panic over mazes and monsters, but isn't that crazy? Yeah, it's. Uh... There was a that was a big deal, Dungeons and Dragons, and and the whole uh, parents being scared of of what was going to happen, and you know <laughs> rituals that were going on and stuff like that. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy uh, what spawns from stuff like that. But yeah, I don't, I I don't know. I if you gotta, go wish I had kept all my Dungeons and Dragons books. <laughs> oh yeah, because they're they're so worth a pretty penny. Yeah, expensive now. <laughs> Oh, without a doubt. Um, anything else for Kolchak, Dave? You you wanna you wanna ask there? I don't believe so. I think I've covered everything. But there was an article that uh, Kindle had written about uh, some very early horror, maybe the five best early horror movies, and one okay. of them was called The Ghost Breaker, nineteen fourteen, <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille. I'm familiar with the 1940s Bob Hope, Paulette Goddard. Do I need to One go back and see this 1914? Am I going to be able to find it? Is it just in book form? What What is yeah. it? No, you will not be able to find it because it doesn't exist. So okay. uh, this is maybe something that, that again, the, the – your your learned audience will undoubtedly know this, but the average uh, yeah. folk on the street probably doesn't know that something like seventy to eighty percent of the films made before nineteen twenty nine are gone. Yep. Um, we've talked either... about this over and over. Yep, it sucks. It really does. So, Ghostbreaker was one of those. Uh, so, for me, studying that film, I had to go back and get the script and the shooting uh, schedules and all of the. Now, those are all available. You can look at the script. You can look at the stills from the, the event. You can look at the reviews and the uh, memos. You can look at the budgets. You can do all that sort of stuff, but the films themselves yeah. are lost. But it is a great, great film. And it is, it, for me, what's interesting about The Ghost Breaker, it, there was this period in American film in the teens and really into the 20s where when they made horror movies, the monster was always a fake. I call it the, the Scooby-Doo era. 
right? <laughs> and so you get all these films where like Cat in the Canary, The Monster, The Bat, uh, um, Seven Foot Prince to Satan, which is another great, that, that one you can watch. That's amazing. That's a great film. Um, mm. All these have supernatural creatures and the internet old dark house and like the old dark house, you're convinced it's something horrible. And in the end, like Scooby-Doo, uh, they're unmasked and we find out it, it's, it's not. And The Ghost Breaker is a classic one of those, so. Yeah, Paul's mentioning London After Midnight. That's the, the holy grail of most horror uh, historians is everybody dreams one day of popping up in a canister and finding London After Midnight. Alas, it has not yet happened. But uh, but they yeah. did find the uh, the 1910 version of uh, Frankenstein. So Edison has a 1910 version of the Frankenstein story, and that was found about you know tw 20 years ago or so. That was that was another film that was lost for a long time. Yeah, every now and then they, they go ahead and they find uh, something in somebody's basement or, or locked up in a vault somewhere. Uh, and I'm sure there's still more out there, but it is a shame that we didn't know what was going to happen to those film reels uh, back in the day. But uh, it kind of stinks. But um, yeah, uh, your take on... Um, uh boy i don't even know where to go from here uh kolchak i mean it, it's kolchak's just so great and um i think it's influenced well we all know that x files and stuff like that but um made for tv movies in general from the 70s or 70s horror uh how do you think it kind of influenced uh what we do get today or does it at all i mean i think a lot of the filmmakers you know the last decade were Folks of my generation, so I'm 54, so that we're talking about folks in, in their mid-50s, last decade or so, been, been kind of rising to prominence. And we were the kids who, that's where we were getting horror. Like, you know, I, I snuck out to see Halloween in 1978, so that was probably a little, a little young to see Halloween. Uh, but for the what? most part, we were watching Kolchak reruns on CBS Late Night. We were watching... Um, gargoyles. We were watching, you know, the Devil's Triangle. We were watching all those sorts of TV movies, and so I think that was probably for a lot of people of my generation their first introduction to horror. Were you know those maybe the three thirty creature feature films that were the after school specials, but those films were, were kind of what influenced I think a whole generation. That was our perspective on horror. So where older generations had their Dracula and Frankenstein. We had our Gargoyle, our Yano Skorzeny, we had our Kolchak, <laughs> like that was our generation. And I think, you know, certainly when you look at television, you know, the influence of Kolchak is, is pretty undeniable. I mean, everything, uh, when Buffy the Vampire Slayer gets picked up, in fact, when Twin Peaks get picked up, which is maybe yeah. not as closely related, one of the things the ABC executives talk about is, this seems like Kolchak, we should give it a shot. Um, Eric Kripke, who did Supernatural, was explicit. He he was ripping off Kolchak. He just had a <laughs> pair of brothers instead of one guy, but he was like, I want to make a Kolchak series. So um, the influence of Kolchak, I think not only in television, um, but also in film, but also in video games, right? The, the, the kind of monster hunter as protagonist, all that kind of flows through Kolchak. So I don't think you could overestimate the impact of that television series, even though it never got the ratings during its airing. So. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I don't know if Dave's got another question, but I do have a really big question. Unless you want to ask one, Dave, go ahead. I was just going to say that when Kendall comes to Los Angeles, because you mentioned Halloween, um, let me know, because I will take you to the Halloween house and the right. Bob Church and everything that is around here, because it's just like all concentrated. And we can even go to the Columbo stall house. <laughs> perfect perfect no i love that's one of my favorite things about halloween now that i watch it as an adult as a child i did not notice the details i was too terrified of the guy with the knife but you know when you look at every tree is glowing green like it's the most la summer day in the world and then there are these leaves blowing through and you think where, where did those leaves come from there's not a tree anywhere with a little leaf on it but you know yeah most likely halloween halloween's 80 degrees here yeah, exactly, right. exactly. And I do want to pick up on Paul's point. Uh, uh, and again, thanks, Paul. I feel like we, I feel like again, we think we should have a cup of coffee one day. Um, 
the yeah. other great thing for people who loved Kolchak is uh, the story did not end with the television series. And certainly we have had some great comic books. There was actually recently a, uh, a kind of anthology of comics. Um, James, someone will remember his last name. I'm blanking. Uh, old senior man moment uh, that won a Bram Stoker Award that was all about Kolchak. A bunch of recent writers and comic book artists making a whole anthology of different Kolchak stories. Uh, there are a number of additional novels. Moonstone Publishing uh, picked up the rights. So if you love Kolchak, you can keep uh, following Carl's Adventures post-television. So there's a lot, a lot of material out there. Nice. Very cool. Um, I, I did have a question that I thought, eh, what the heck? Uh, I'd like to ask this. Um, is, is there a horror film or decade, you can either or, in horror that has influenced pop culture the most? Yeah, 1970s. And I'll call it the long 1970s. So I would I will define that as 1968 to 1982. Um, and okay. I argue, and I, 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 think, I don't think many people disagree with me, but my argument is I think there have been three golden ages of horror. Uh, the first is the 1930s, which is when the – actually, the term first gets coined in between Dracula and Frankenstein. Uh, people start yeah. saying it's a horror cycle. That's kind of the first time people are talking about horror as a type of film. Um, yeah. So that's clearly the first golden age, no question. The second golden yeah. age is that period of the 70s. For me, it starts with Night of the Living Dead. Uh, and you get – between Night of the Living Dead and John Carpenter's The Thing – you, you, we could spend the entire hour naming yeah. iconic horror that came from that period. Everything from big oh, yeah. budget studio like Alien and Exorcist and Rosemary's Baby to super low budget weirdo stuff like Night of the Living Dead or Last House on the Left, the Friday the 13th. I mean, we can Halloween, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I would sort of argue, and this is something I've done recently, is that we're kind of in what I think is the third golden age. And I, I would say particularly Get Out probably deserve credit for being the film that that at least got everyone in the culture talking about horror. Uh, and since then, we've got, you know, such a tremendous variety and consistently successful. And even in this age, you know, we're now at the kind of seeing potentially the end of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Horror is still consistently being profitable. Not That's not making a billion dollars. Um, mm, but right. it is consistently a profitable genre. People are, and people at this time, when many Americans are like, I'm not going to go to the theater, I'll wait for it to come out, including young people, right? Young people are like, why do I go to the movie theater? They will go for horror. Horror will still draw its audience. So I think we're in a really exciting time for those of us who are fans of the genre. Well, there are so many different outlets. And, and as you had mentioned earlier, I mean, everyone's got a streaming service of one way or another. And there's mm -hmm. people who are marketing to those streaming services. Uh, in a, another interview, you had mentioned Full Moon Entertainment um, and the Puppet Master series. Love you know, is is an entry one of my entryways, at least in the late '80s, into mm -hmm. horror that mm -hmm. I thought was so great because at that time in the '80s, it really wasn't on TV. It was movies uh, until you get to maybe Friday the Thirteenth series, kind of lame. Um, Freddy's Nightmares, again, not my best favorite thing. It wasn't until X-Files where we really started getting more TV monsters. But I loved Puppet Master and, and do, you, do you still follow the series? Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no I think, general, you know. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that, the great thing about the 80s. Which, which is, I mean, again, I will, I'll be clear by saying that like the 30s and the 70s and the now are golden ages. That's not to say the other ages don't matter. There's actually really cool stuff. And one of the great things, you know, that, that Dave points out about the 80s was you suddenly had um, this direct to video. So all yeah. that VHS stuff, I mean, <clears throat> you know, the full moon production, Puppet Master, Doll Man, Evil Toys, like, you know, it was. That was super fun, similar to the 1970s made for TV movies, low budget, high concept, and that that's a great time. And maybe we're getting back to that with some of the streaming services, but I don't know that we'll ever recapture the fun of that period. Yeah, that was no, a lot. I, yeah, I've, I've said that <laughs> over and over and over. The the especially full full moon uh, trauma pictures uh, with Lloyd Kaufman and all that. The 80s. Believe it or not, I love the 30s. I love that whole universal horror. You know, that is what I love. But I think the 80s and everything that came out of the 80s 
is what I love the most when it comes to horror. Um, it varies, I'm sure, for everybody, but I love the cheesiness. Uh, mm -hmm. I love that there was so much of it, and there was so much good yeah. stuff. 82, like you mentioned, probably one of the best years of horror ever, I think. Uh, lots of great, great movies like The Thing and others uh, ha have come out during that one particular year. Um, but yes, I mean, come on. Full Moon is not the same today as it was then. No. But I think the 80s really, it, it's just... It's it's going to last forever. People are going to look at the 80s like they did the 30s, I think, in, in my opinion, because um, so much came out of that era. If nothing else, for the VHS cover art, like I feel, I still, feel, I feel like that's oh, an undiscovered yeah. world, right? How how many times do, some people are talking about going to the video stores? Like you walk in the yes. video store, you see those incredible covers, and then you get home and you put the movie in. It's like, wait, what ha what happened to that incredible, exciting monster that now is just like a you know styrofoam can well, I, I think that's what got me to love a lot of these like full moon features and and the 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 so bad they're good films you know uh and then there were films like extra which were just so bizarre that they were good you know yeah i don't know if you've seen extra but you know oh yeah yeah, yeah. no yeah I, again, I, I love the high concept or high concept, low budget. Like it, it's, and I feel yeah. like again, I, not to be super old man critical. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. See, I'm, I'm, I'm got my water here. Uh, not to be super uh, old man, like get off my yard, you kids. But I feel like much of what's happening in the mainstream media today is big, huge budgets, massive spectacles, zero idea, like just not yep. a not a single interesting thought whereas yeah. full moon or the tv movies the 70s yeah they didn't have a budget for anything but they had adventurous they had fun. weird ideas they yeah. Had fun. yeah they had fun they had a story and then they got bad actors and then they had fun <laughs> you know what i mean it, and it made for a good fun. they don't make films like they used to That's kendall right. like rawhead rex thank you yeah shadow exactly. absolutely love it and Paul Ham saying all the good, spookies. Listen, people will rip spookies apart, but you know what? I enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I tell you, one of my favorite from that era is The Gate. I still, I still yeah. periodically will will watch that, and I love similar sort of like the little tiny claymation demon things, and they look so fake and so bad, and yet it works. It just, it just works. It did. Yes. Yes. The well, I think part. Well, I wanted to also mention in the 80s, I loved watching Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah. That was my first introduction to him. I loved, like, you know, his countdown. There are 37 dead bodies. There are, you know, there's <laughs> and one monkey mutilation. <laughs> but earlier on growing up, and my introduction to Hammer Horror was Elvira. And I know uh, Dino had Superhost where he lived in Ohio. And uh, who did you have as a, a Ben Goulardi and Son of Ghoul, but yeah, oh, okay. horror host. We just had Elvira on the West Coast, and, and that's all we needed. But um, <laughs> what, Kendall, did you have a, a Saturday or Sunday host that you watched? Yeah, it was Joe Bob Briggs. So that was, you know, that was that, that's the first I remember. I do remember hearing of or seeing in other parts of the country, like Spengooley. Um, and I do, and I know the history is that there's horror hosts going all the way back into the forties and fifties, but Joe Bob was the um, first one that I remember routinely, you know, tuning in for, to see that like incredibly bad movie. And, and again, I, I think that's one of the things that makes horror different than a lot of other genres. I mean, we all like to laugh at comedies or we cry at weepies or whatever it is, but, uh, horror is such a communal experience. Like we really want to watch horror together. And that's why the horror hosts are great. That's why a community like you've got here in the chat and on this show, it just shows you how much we like to experience this collectively. And I think, I think that's what makes it so much fun. Well, I think Mark uh, DeWidziak also says how personal horror is. What's scary to me may not be scary to you. You know, if, if, you had a scratch cornea as a kid, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> you got something poking in your eye. That's horrible. And, uh, you know, yeah. when we were talking about uh, a couple of weeks ago, the devil's platform on Kolchak, it was great because it had different elements of horror, that elevator falling down. For a lot of us, that is one of our biggest fears is, 
is falling in an elevator. Um, and there were a couple also other fears of, uh, of dogs, um, you know, making a deal with the devil. It, it, I thought it was a great episode because it went on horror in different ways. It approached it in different ways. Yeah, I oh, think yeah. Kolchak was really good about that. Uh, you know, even in its limited run with whatever its limitations were, it did, I mean, it did run the gamut, right? We had everything from, <laughs> you know, ancient <laughs> medicine men, uh, shamans returning to Hindu demons to, uh, you know, dream creatures coming out to aliens a couple of times, you know. The man at all. Yeah. <laughs> if you remember that, what a weird, bizarre movie that was, too. Lady had something growing on it, you know, it's oh, yeah. her back and it just grew, grew. And then there was that creepy scene in like space where he he just crawled out of her back and then just he it was very, very it was like a Native American type <laughs> spell going on or something like that. It was well now weird. no one's brought up basket case. Well where's Bilal? Where's Bilal's fans there? Come on. Bill Isle. I love Bill Isle. I, we, we made a whole video, me and Ted, back in the day, uh, and we had a basket on the side of us. We were doing a full commentary on the movie. And at the very end, I kind of CGI'd uh, something, a little devil coming out of the basket. What's it? Because I kept asking through the commentary, what's in the basket? What's in the basket? What's in the, you know, and then eventually it pops up. <laughs> love basket case. Now, the second and third film, yeah, they were still okay, but man, you're talking ten years later. You know, it's a different feel. That's that's kind of the whole thing. Uh, I w point I was trying to make earlier is you can't capture certain things sometimes. So uh, it is what it is. Paul Ham, the Manitou, yeah, that's a great one. Manitou, the Manitou. I also have a very strange story with that, and Dave knows about it. Where my uncle, my uncle, always passed out Kendall at. Uh, well, he passed out at the Exorcist and the Manitou, and I was a little kid. <laughs> and oh, my no. uncle, goes, I need to get out. Oh yeah, he, I gotta get out of the car. And he gets out of the car and he falls down and collapses. And people are coming over and giving him CPR and everything. And I'm looking uh, at Reagan throwing up on this. <laughs> and my <laughs> uncle's back there, and I'm like, Is he dying? What's going on? You know. So. Horrors, yeah, it's it's a big impact on my life. And uh, heck, from five years old, my my parents or grandparents didn't care. I, I was watching uh, Jason Voorhees throw people through the window, and I'm five years old, and they didn't care. Nobody thought <laughs> twice about that kind of stuff back then. You know, rated R, PG, whatever. I don't know. Just my family, I guess. And Ian Sharp brought up Frank and Hooker. Oh, Ian. Amen. Well, you know, listen, Frank and Hooker, I, I have to uh, say, uh, it's it's got some allure to it. <laughs> There's something that I enjoy about that movie. But uh, listen, it's a bad movie, but it's so bad it's good. Anyway, well, it, it's a lot. Thank you, CM. I I was gonna bring up It's Alive, and if you if folks haven't seen it, there is an It's Alive three Island of the Alive uh, that takes it to sort of doll man full moon production but freddie has a great point and i, I and actually <clears throat> pumpkin head i believe pumpkin head really belongs in the more iconic level so not just the so bad it's good uh, pumpkin head yeah. to me is as good as friday the 13th or nightmare on elm street that first movie is absolutely brilliant i don't quite know why it didn't catch an audience you know it wasn't quite as iconic or had the big cultural movement as some of the other uh, kind of creature features of the 80s but man if you haven't watched the original pumpkin head do yourself a favor go track that down it is absolutely brilliant yeah a lot of people recognize it as as well i mean it never had as you know a franchise like you know jason or freddie or any of the other ones but uh, even mcfarland toys they put it in the movie maniac it was part of their line so you know, he even thought enough to put it in that kind of, uh, you know, uh, thing. So, yeah, um, I don't know. Dave, you got another question or should we? Uh, I'd like to talk about some of the older films, but go ahead. I, I would love to do that. Duck Dodgers did mention They Live, uh, which kind of oh blends that horror with science fiction with politics of the age. You know, so yeah. it's really... You know, when you start digging into They Live, it is such a fantastic film and probably among my top 10. Yeah. 
No, I think we could do a whole, uh, and again, one of the books I wrote has a section on John Carpenter. And I, I do think he, along with Wes Craven and George Romero, are the architects for the modern horror. I think even to this day, we're still working with their blueprint. But, you know, <clears throat> people, you know, John Carpenter's an interesting guy. Like, you know, the, the first three films are like, rockets right and, and i'm not counting mm -hmm. the dark star the first one but you look at halloween massive cultural moment right really redefines slasher becomes the iconic the fog super successful escape from new york i think one of my favorite films probably one of my favorite john carpenter films brilliant film yeah. absolutely great then he does the thing which is probably his best film without a doubt like in terms of pure cinematic expertise it's all there still holds up you throw the thing on the, the, this big screen today and people will still watch it the effects are good everything else but the audience the, the american audience hated it i mean people called it violent pornography it tanked hmm. the box office partly because it came out just a couple of months after et so like by 1982 we liked our alien with reese's pieces not with like tentacles uh. growing out of its skull but the <laughs> later john carpenter work like some of that stuff that was uber low budget they live um, one of my personal favorites is Prince of Darkness. Like I still find the okay. scene where Satan's hand is coming out of the mirror as one of the most chilling scenes. I just think Prince of Darkness is absolutely brilliant. But another film that is high concept, very low budget, and has a cameo from Alice Cooper. So we should throw that in there too. <laughs> Alice Cooper. Yeah, no, listen, They Live is, is very, very cool. Um, not as cheesy as a lot of the 80s films and, and had a lot to say, but the fight scene alone, I mean, we all know that, right? I mean, come on. Uh, it it kind of influenced uh, an episode of Family Guy where, where Peter gets in a fight with the chicken and it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, love that, love that. But yeah, I'd like to talk about some of the old, listen, 1930s, when we just start off with uh, Universal and we get Dracula and Frankenstein, the mummy. Um, I mean, again, I, I think that's where it all started. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, I, listen, I know there is stuff that's lost, you know, things were made beforehand. We, we have, uh, you know, Nosferatu and other uh, silence that were fantastic, but it really, I think, started right there with the universal horror and again i think that right there has influenced everything horror up to this day um I, i'd like to hear you talk a little bit about that yeah i mean it's interesting um and one of the books i wrote was about the silent era because it, it's a it's a weird it's a weird question at, at one level you're absolutely right People prior to 1931 are not calling films horror films. Yeah, they may, there's a place where you find they say the film is full of horrors or terror or creepy or whatever, but you don't have people talking about a type of film. Like these are horror films. That doesn't happen until 31. But yeah. the flip side is that from really 1896, you have films that are using all the same stuff. They're like seven different versions of Jekyll and Hyde. As we said, there's a version of, of Frankenstein from 1910. There are ghosts and monsters, et cetera, et cetera. But they never quite develop into, and I think part of it was America in the teens and 20s, the, the gatekeepers didn't like horror because it was so wrapped up in superstition and the supernatural. And they really wanted Americans to be educated and rational and progressive. And they wanted this, they had this idea of a very pragmatic American um, culture. And they were a little bit afraid of what motion pictures might influence young people, immigrants, the uneducated. So there's a lot of effort to kind of shut down horror. Then you get to 1931. And it's interesting, you know, um, Universal had originally a big plan for uh, Dracula, much closer to the novel. If people read the novel, big sweeping. So their original plan was for a big kind of spectacle. Dracula, Lon Chaney was meant to play Dracula. Then two things happened, the Great Depression, so all the money was gone. Uh, and then Lon Chaney died of throat cancer. So suddenly mm. they lost their star. They lost their big budget. Dracula falls back into the back burners. And then because Universal is really struggling financially in the 30s, like they're, they're, they're of all the studios, they're the hardest hit by the Great Depression, the closest to bankrupt. And they would go bankrupt a little, a few years later, like in the mid 30s, they go bankrupt. But they roll the dice and put a version of Dracula that is essentially the stage play into production with Bela Lugosi, who had played the part uh, in, in, in theaters. Um, and it was massive. 
And if you go and get a chance, Dave, you're there in LA, go check out um, USC has some of the archives. The Herrick, which is the Academy of Motion Picture, has their archives. You can see the corporate memos from Universal, the executives puzzling, why is this movie so popular? Like, why, why are audiences <laughs> lining up? This is not a great film. Like, nobody there thought it was a great film. Um, but for some reason, it tapped into audiences. Like, they just really went for... And again, in some ways, it kind of makes sense. It's a little bit of a truism, but I think it is in some ways true that when the country is in turmoil, people turn to horror. 1931 is the worst year of the Great Depression, the highest level of unemployment, the highest level of bank closures. And people should remember, in this time, when the banks closed, your money was gone. There's no insurance. Yeah. There's no FDIC. Like, if your savings bank is gone, you got nothing. If your house is gone, it's gone. Like, there's no social safety network in 1931. So the world felt like it was turning upside down and, and Americans turned to two things. They turned to horror and they turned to Shirley Temple. Now I can't explain the Shirley Temple. <laughs> uh, but horror makes sense. And then, you know, then shortly after Dracula makes, you know, uh, is really, is literally breaking box office records. Um, Universal starts digging through their claw, uh, through their uh, scripts and through their, uh, the products they had, uh, licensed for, uh, and they found Frankenstein. And they put Frankenstein, which is, again, nothing against Todd Browning or Dracula, but Frankenstein is a much better film. Um, it's much, the acting's better, the script is better, there's not much about it that's not better. And those yeah. two films become the foundation. Those are the founding pillars of horror, even to this day. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Um, well, uh, especially with, you know, it's interesting to also think when these movies are coming out in the 1930s, these are Gothic novels from the late 1800s. They're already close to 50 years old by the time we get there. And I think it's very interesting the way we kind of, you know, ebb and flow along with, and especially writing this in the 1930s, our fear of the other. Yeah. And we see that with track and, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, we have a fear of foreigners and, and all of a sudden we have that in HP Lovecraft, we have that uh, in Kolchak and, and it's just, it's really kind of an interesting thing. We also see it in, in, uh, in Charlie Chan as well. You know, it's very difficult for you to be non-white during this era. And that was to, to build on Dave's point, and it's a really good point. That was part of why the American, again, censors and the kind of cultural elite were so worried about horror in the 1920s, um, even up to 1931, is that they were really worried that horror, because so much of the horror tradition comes from Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, you know, it's, it's Gothic novels, it's Catholic traditions, and that was not considered American. Like those, that was other. And so they really wanted to gatekeep to try to push those weird superstitious beliefs out. Then suddenly, you know, Dracula and Frankenstein come in. And how do they come in? Part of the way they, they enter in, part of the way they're kind of justified is that they're great literature. And if, if you ever get yeah. a chance to go back and look at, you know, we talk about, you know, Edison has a 1910 version of Frankenstein. There was a promotional booklet that came with it. So if you were rented it at your theater and you got the canister of the film, you would get this little booklet that was like Edison explaining the, the film. And a lot of what they talk about in that pamphlet is, oh, we know this is scary and, and weird and supernatural, but it's great literature. We've tried to, to cut down the <laughs> scary and the weird and the gothic and focus on the great literature. And same thing with Dracula. So, so if you look at those first round of iconic 1930s horror films, it's Dracula, it's Frankenstein, it's Jekyll and Hyde, it's the Invisible Man. So we're literally talking like all the iconic figures of, um, of English literature right there in a row. You know, mm -hmm. Stoker, Shelley, Wells, Stevenson, like right, all together. And that became sort of the justification for making these films. Well, yes, they're creepy and scary, but they're great literature and we need to honor great literature. And so you get that kind of cover of, of, of quality, I guess. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okra, okra. We didn't want another Salem witch trials. What's going on? Good to see you. Um, yeah, no, I think it's what kicked everything off, you know, kicked off horror, like you said, and, uh, I think influences everything to this day. Um, 
I, I, I don't want to get into other, I'm trying to stay on topic here. I could go all over the place because I'm a big Giallo fan. Uh, well, I, I, Paul, one thing we haven't mentioned in Paul Hamilton oh, really? is King yeah. Kong. Also from the 1930s. And I, I don't necessarily consider that horror. I almost yeah. consider it sci-fi in a way of, of having this gigantic animal. So yeah, I don't but, know. I call it a creature feature. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I don't think you get King Kong without Dra Frankenstein's success. And if you look at the marketing of King Kong, particularly like the posters, um, the the similarity in the visuals. So a lot of the early um, Frankenstein posters were the monster is loose and you see him breaking out of chains and lunging through. And it's very similar with Kong on the building with the chains off his arm. And so you get that um, very yeah. similar. I will say that to, to, to Dino's point earlier about the importance of Dracula and Frankenstein. Um, part of it is that they are the two faces of horror that I think yeah. we still have with us today. Dracula is unrelentingly evil. It, right? There's no question Dracula is evil. There's no redeeming him, but it's a kind of seductive evil. It's like pure chaos and appetite and hunger and consumption, but there's no redeeming Dracula, at least in the, the Bela Lugosi version. I mean, he, he's not a secretly a nice guy, right? <laughs> Frankenstein, on the other hand, same with Kong, they're misfits, right? Yeah. Frankenstein is actually kind of the sympathetic figure in Frankenstein, the movie, as is Kong, right? You sort of say, they're just people who didn't belong in this world. This world doesn't understand them, and they're kind of persecuted. And for me, those are the two faces of the monster going all the way through. The misfit... And the, and and the and the kind of consuming seductive embodiment of evil and almost through the history of horror you can classify horror you know movie monsters as either being one of those two sides and I think that really goes back to the success of Dracula and Frankenstein there in 1931. Did yeah, you see the recent uh, Demeter film? I did actually. I just watched that on a plane. So yeah, I did just watch okay. that. All right, because I, yeah. I know it wasn't very good at the box office, but I from people who have actually watched it, they say it's pretty decent, you know? Yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. It's, I would say it's good. I think they I think they overplayed the creepy hallway in the mm. boat. Like it's, it's a little, it gets a little repetitive by the time you get into the second hour and you're sort of thinking. Yeah, that's all I got okay. here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I get <laughs> Is there anything else going to happen? <laughs> oh, geez. See, that's what I was worried about. You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's, it's a great concept. Let's, let's take it to the boat. Um, but it, it does sound like, nah, it's not the greatest. It was um, fine. It was fine. It was fine. Okay. If you got nothing to do and you want to sit down and watch it, go ahead and watch it. That's right. Uh, as to Duck Dodgers, uh, Frankenstein is actually sci-fi. Um, listen, there's science fiction uh, elements in a horror film. This is a horror film. Frankenstein is a horror film. <laughs> uh, but do they use science, you know, to resurrect the, the monster? Yes. Um, I, I don't know your take on it, but uh, maybe you could throw sci-fi like they do on IMDb, horror, sci-fi, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I certainly don't think in 1931 those categories would have been distinct, uh, nor would either of them be fully defined, so it'd be very vague. There's no, I mean, I don't disagree. There's a lot of science, a lot of Frankenstein will lead itself into science fiction, but there's right. no question that Frankenstein is advertised as a horror film. It's talked about as a horror film. It's put out as a horror film. There's no, there's no question. The archival documentation is overwhelming. Um, but I would say it's interesting to me that talk about the history of science fiction, you know, science fiction kind of gets its main play in American movies, you know, starting in the 1950s. And the first two films that come out that are kind of the Hollywood's effort to get into sci-fi. I don't want to get into the first, but Hollywood's big effort in sci-fi in the 1950s are The Thing from Another World, which is kind of Beautiful. Frankenstein slash Dracula. <laughs> You've got this creature like that looks like Frankenstein, but it's not a misfit. It's not misunderstood. It is there to drink our blood and reproduce yeah. and create carrot creatures uh, and kill us all. And you've got uh, the day the earth stood still, which mm -hmm. is in some ways almost thematically closer to Frankenstein. Like there's this alien who comes to kind of warn us, but we don't understand. We won't listen to them. So again, I think it's interesting that you kind of get those two faces. And that also plays out in science fiction. The aliens either come 
to kill us and eat us and consume us or the aliens come to try to teach us something. We're the problem. Like we're the ones that don't understand. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and man, two great films you just said right there, man. I love fifties, uh, right? Dave, Dave loves it too. Too much. No, you don't. <laughs> too much. I could do without science fiction personally. Dave, Dave's not a big fan, but I tell you what, I loved those, those two in particular that you just mentioned. Th those are just masterpieces of film. Um, in my opinion, uh, but when you when you start getting into all of the other films of the era uh, where they do start to get a little bit more lower budget, Dave, <laughs> and, and stuff, I still love the fact that for, for me, what I love about them is how the scientist comes in and starts throwing around the mumbo jumbo, you know, like this is the reason behind it and all that. But, uh, you know, I, I love it. I love it. I love the space movies of the 50s and 60s. But, um, yeah, Dave don't. <laughs> and those partly came out of television, right? It was it was the, the competition. You know, so two big industry changes happened. This may be too inside baseball for anybody to care about. Um, in 1948, the big studio monopolies is, are broken up. So the Supreme Court rules uh, that, you know, the in fact, so to, to explain the monopolies, probably most of you, if you live in any kind of large town, if you look at your history, you probably had a movie theater that's called the Paramount or the RKO or something like that because the movie yeah. theaters were owned by the studios. And so they yep. were literally vertical monopolies. They owned the studio distribution point of sale. Um, that kind of got by for a long time. In 1948, mm -hmm. Supreme Court finally rules that that's a monopoly. They have to sell off. They have to break up. They have to lose parts of this. They don't have the monopoly they had. At the same time, suddenly television comes into play. Now suddenly you've got competition from essentially a free service that's able to give people more or less the same kind of entertainment you're giving. So the studios start pulling back the number of productions, which means there's space for all these other smaller studios to start making all those creature feature sort of films uh, that Dave evidently doesn't like. So, um, <laughs> so it was kind of that uh, similar sort of thing, like all these different industries and competition opening up this space. But it's also what opened up space in theaters for things like Hammer Horror, which some people were talking about earlier, you know, and, and the international horror stuff. And eventually... By the time you get to the 60s, it opens up the space for the more graphic horror. I'll tell one last story. Um, some of you may have already heard this. When Night of the Living Dead, the George Romero film, is first released, it's released as part of a double feature uh, with, I believe it was Attack of the Saucer Creatures. And it was released as a children's matinee. And so lots of theaters were showing this as part of a two-part series. Uh, you know, two, two double feature in their matinee. And so one of the first times anybody nationally is writing about Night of the Living Dead, it's Roger Ebert. Many of you may remember Roger Ebert, um, but not a review of the film. He's actually, it's a critique of parents who just dropped their kids off to see a movie. And he goes through in detail of how these kids have been watching sci-fi creature feature and Night of the Living Dead comes on. And they just, they're, they're, they're throwing popcorn and they're laughing and they're laughing. And then at some point they're quiet. And then they're, gently sobbing and then they're <laughs> heavily <laughs> sobbing and he's talking about how horrible this is um but it's that same so you, know, you almost get that you can wow. sort of see the genealogy from the 30s into the 40s the, the 50s with the creature features that leads to night of the living dead that opens up space for this really brutal period of horror which lays the groundwork oh, yeah. for where we are now so it kind of all works together in weird ways can we talk about psycho for a minute oh god yeah that is one of uh, my favorite movies and also um, a movie that I've shown my class because no one's ever seen it. And so we do, we'll do a breakdown of it, you know, and, and everything. And it is such a fantastic film. I don't think it gets enough credit today for what it did back then. Um, the, there was so many great marketing ideas around the movie you know, you can't come in after the movie started, things like that. And it's so horrific when there's only two people who die. And the idea of losing a star of the film 45 minutes into the film and just leaving everyone wondering what happened. And then I always laugh at our 80s version, which most of us saw Psycho 2 before we saw the original Psycho. Mm -hmm. And it was more of a teenage slasher killer, you know, let's look at, you know, hot girls type of film 
<laughs> no, I, you would, you really would be hard pressed to overestimate how important Psycho was. Like it really was um, a turning point in the history of the genre and in fairness, in the history of Hollywood, you know, um, people, it's easy to forget that this was like a Hitch, like 48th film. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Hitchcock had been insanely productive. And at that point in 1960, He's got a television show. He's got a radio. You know, Alfred Hitchcock presents. He's got a book series. Everybody knows Alfred Hitchcock. And part of what led Hitchcock to want to make Psycho was people were talking about other new directors being the new Hitchcock. And like Hitchcock mm. was saying, "Hey, wait a minute. There's no new Hitchcock. <laughs> I'm Hitchcock. Who the hell are these people coming in? Like Orson Welles making Touch of Evil, and he's the new Hitchcock." So Hitchcock went to his brain trust, which were a trio of women, including his wife who kind of helped him make decisions and said, find me something nasty. They found this book by Robert Block uh, that had not sold very well, but told a kind of unpleasant story based loosely on Ed Gein. They transformed that in the movie. Um, the studio does not want to release it. Um, they tell him that, uh, that they don't want him to make it. He says he will. They give him a budget of like $800,000, which is a fraction of what he had for his previous film. Uh, he said he'll make it anyway. Uh, they said, well, there's nowhere on the lot, the studio lot, the Paramount lot is entirely full. There's nowhere for you to film. He said, that's fine. I make a TV show over at Universal, so I'll just go make it over there. Uh, and <laughs> the film was, uh, today's point, insanely, insanely popular. Uh, in fact, audience reaction was so dramatic, screaming and laughing and throwing popcorn, that uh, Hitchcock went to UCLA's psychology department and asked, could you do a study of why audiences are reacting so dramatically to this film? Like I knew it was good, but not this good. And they said, we could, it will cost you $10,000. And he said, I'm good. I'll, I'll, I'll pass it. You know. um, but, but there's no doubt Psycho is, is, is absolutely massive. Not, not least of which is it was the film that really created the idea of the movies having very particular show times. Like prior to that, people just came and went you know, they came to a double feature, they came to, you know, the films were on a constant rotation. So people didn't have that idea of the movie is at 7.15, you come at 7.15, you be seated. That was really popularized by Hitchcock. I loved reading about it and it, that it was produced in 42 days, which is an incredible, you know, short amount of time. Yeah. Seven of those days were was the shower scene, which lasts a minute mm -hmm. on, yeah. on the screen. And... Um, it was also funny because I asked my class, I go, you know, why do you think it's in black and white? And they're all, well, because it's old. And I'm like, no, it, he did it in black and white because it was cheap. Yeah. You know, it's cheaper than color. I go, you had color films in the 1960s. And I go, this, I don't think it would have worked in black and white, in, in color either. It works so good in black and white. No, it, it absolutely is. It's a masterpiece. It's one of the films one, that every time I see it, I feel like I see something new. And I'll just say this. If folks haven't watched it in a while, when you go back and watch it, clearly the shower scene is, is the star. But I would encourage you all, um, pay attention to the minute or so after the shower scene. right? So the camera pulls out of Janet Lee's eye. And then watch that camera sort of like, the, for the first time, and this is unusual in American filmmaking, you know, cameras are usually attached to something, to somebody. A yeah. camera follows you into the room, it follows somebody out, it follows a serving cart, it follows something. Like, cameras attach. Suddenly, the camera has nothing to attach to. And so, the, for about a minute and a half, the camera is completely free. It pulls back from her, it meanders over and shows us the money and sort of says, hey, you thought this was about the money. Well, the money's still there. It wasn't about that. It kind of looks around the room, reinforcing the idea, to Dave's point, that our protagonist is dead. Like, we were with her. We're with Marion. Marion's dead. What the hell happens to us? And then only after leaving us lingering in this hotel room, awkwardly not sure what's going on next, then we hear Norman saying, mother, mother, the blood, the blood. And then we attach to Norman. It's like, okay, now we're back to normal. But there's this wonderful, strange moment in the middle of Psycho where the audience is literally unconnected to anything and just floating around this hotel room kind of thinking, what's going to happen next? That is powerful horror filmmaking. Right. For me, what makes a horror film really iconic is there ought to be one moment where the audience says, you can't do that. Like, no, you, you can't do that. You can't <laughs> kill that person. You can't do that thing. You can't leave yeah. here. Right. That and, and Hitchcock was obviously a master at that. So brilliant, brilliant film.
Well, yeah, I, th I think you bring a lot of the, the elements of uh, psychological thrillers or, or just a, it's basically a psychological horror, too. Um, and he brought a lot of that into uh, this horror film. So and I think that's what stands out. Yeah, really interesting with the book as well. And I would encourage everyone, especially with Psycho 2, the book is so much better than the film and the book might even be better than the original Psycho. It's really, really close. However, on Psycho the Book, it's so interesting to note that Norman Bates is older. He is heavy set. He's bald. He's George Costanza. He can lift 20 pounds <laughs> over his head. Um, yes. He is not the good looking Norman Bates that we have in the film. There's also one chapter that they leave out of the, out of the story, um, which is chapter one. Psycho, the movie starts with chapter two, and it's really interesting to go back and reread because everything else is almost word for word. Marion Crane is another name, but uh, besides that, the, the book and the movie run consistently. No, and I think, yeah, absolutely. And it's funny that, um, you know, Hitchcock blind bid for the book, so Robert Block had no idea that, that, <laughs> that low ball offer was going to go on to Hitchcock. Uh, and he also, uh, Hitchcock kind of made efforts to make sure no one read the book. Like he really wanted that kept secret. But a couple of people, uh, Duck Dodgers and some other folks are talking about like the Tingler and Sears James and others. Um, part of the reason Hitchcock did the, you know, people may have seen the iconic uh, stand up posters of Mr. Hitchcock says no one's allowed in after the movie theater. And then there's a little slot where they could write the movie will start at 715. Part of the reason for that was that period of the late 50s and 60s was full of gimmicks, right? So you had uh, the movie, The Tingler, where the theater staff would install a motor under one of the uh, seats. And the, at some point in the movie, um, I think it's Vincent Price points and says, now I will get you. And then suddenly this motor goes off or, you know, the the William Castle, the 3D glasses or the, the, the scaredy cat glasses, you put them on so you can't see the ghosts and things. Like all that stuff was going on. And so Hitchcock, you know, who wasn't quite the same filmmaker as William Castle, still recognized that he needed to do something to get the audience in. And, and so Psycho was in a way kind of his gimmick film, although obviously it, it uh, transcended that. Yeah, I, I love what, that what William Castle tried to do with a lot of his movies by doing that. And uh, I, I do believe there was like a, even a smell vision or something like that with one of the movies. And he just incorporated a lot of weird effects with uh, the theater experience, which was really cool. No, Sears James makes the point about nurse and ambulance. That was it. He also had a, a million dollar life insurance if you die of fright. I got bad news for you folks. Yes. Die of fright is not actually a medically recognized term. So <laughs> there's no way you're getting that million dollars. But <laughs> on, so the, on your television and, and gimmicks and stuff, I was at the Queen Mary before COVID hit. And they, they have a movie about the Queen Mary. And part of it, they actually splash water on you. Oh, that's great. <laughs> it, yeah. it's just, and it, but it's it's really hokey. It's, it's just like, you know, here's the the birth of the Queen Mary. And you see it sliding in and they flick water at you. It's great. <laughs> well, well, hey, b before people start running off, um, I, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Kendall again. But the link is uh, pinned to the chat and it's in the description. Uh, if you wanted to go to Amazon and, and buy one of his. How many books you got out, Kendall? <laughs> Um, uh, well, 11 or five in theory, but oh, yeah, about, about five, okay. about five, five of those are about horror. So, uh, okay. Okay. So g there you go. And, uh, the link has all of those up there and, um, we didn't even touch on, you know, really a couple of the, the books where one of the books you get into, you know, a lot of the directors like Craven and Carpenter and stuff like that. So, um, lots of good stuff to go up there and get from Kendall on Amazon and, uh, please do that and hit a thumbs up. Um, yeah. And leave a comment after us, to, uh, let us know what you think of it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Any other last things? Uh, I would like to have Kendall on again to talk about some, some other stuff that he has in the works and, um, we'll probably have him on again eventually if he wants to come on. So, yeah. It would be my distinct honor. Love, love you guys. You guys are amazing. Fabulous to be here Thank chatting you. with you. Love all the great comments. Thank you all for uh, for being part of this. It's great. Oh yeah, everybody in the chat uh, been great. Um, you are a Colombo fan too, right? <laughs> 
Yes, and Barnaby Jones. I love all the like Quincy, all all those sort of seventies. So you're a seventies yeah. kind of okay. I got gotcha. you. I've listen. I've been in kind of a seventies kick for quite oh, a while right now. Well, I've had to listen to about Mary Tyler Moore, <laughs> the Bob Newhart another... show, the first Bob Newhart show. Yeah, brilliant. Loved it. Absolutely love it. No. Uh, it's funny. I've never seen a Mary Tyler Moore show either in my life. And it was something my mom always had on the TV. I know. Always had on the TV. And I just never watched. And I started watching it. And I got addicted. And I'm like, oh, man, this is such a great show. It, I rewatched the entire Bob Newhart series. Like from the very beginning. And it's it yeah. was great and wonderful. Rockford Files. Have we all done a Rockford Files episode yet? Yeah. It's another one. Yeah, I know Rockford Files. Yeah. Um, again, I you know, one I haven't really seen in, in a sense that back in the day when I was a kid, uh, I'm going to take it it holds up by Kendall's re, you know, reaction there. You, you love the Rockford Files. So, uh, you know, all those, I mean, McMillan and wife, come on. I, I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying <laughs> they're, I, I'm not going to stand here and say they're politically right. I mean, I, I have to rewatch right, all those right, things, right. but. I tell you what, there's a lot of fun stuff. And I even love that that period, late 70s and 80s, things like the Love Boat, Fantasy Island. Like there was there was Buck Rogers. I mean, come on. This was a time when, you know, things were <laughs> wacky and weird and low. Again, yeah. low budget, high concept. And that I think is what's maybe missing a little bit today. Yeah. Now they pump lots of money into TV series with a lot of need to make that money back. And maybe yeah. they're not as risky. Maybe they're not as, as, as yeah, willing to roll the dice. So, yeah. One yeah. of my favorite TV shows is Soap. Loved it. Oh my God. So ahead of its time. Way ahead of its time. And I would always oh. catch it at night. I would watch, it would be Star Trek, Soap, and then uh, The Late Show. And that's so nice. that's, that's where I would watch it. But, you know, it's out on DVD. First three seasons are great. Fourth one, it, you don't need to get that one. That's when the man end. people, the nostalgia of of what we watched when we were younger, like Dave just said, uh, to stay up at a certain point and watch the Late Show, and then maybe the Late Late Show, and then that flag comes on at the very end, and uh, uh, broadcast is done. Uh, there was nothing <sighs> like it. I tell you. I mean, you think it's a great thing to have everything at your fingertips, and it is, but there are nights I'd like to just shut everything down and just go back to that period and just relive that. Not forever, a day or two, whatever, you know. But anyways, it's been nice to have you here, Kendall. I really appreciate you stopping by. Thank you. Um, it's been great talking to you. Thanks to, to Dave for getting you on here. Uh, thank you, Dave. You're more than welcome. Um, thank you, Kendall, for agreeing to me come and Dave, on. Yeah, and me and Dave will be back next week to talk uh, about Kolchak. So, uh, bad Medicine. Episode we're on eight. Episode 8, yes, Bad Medicine. So I, I'm not sure what to think of it yet, um, but we, we shall see. Witchy woman, uh, whatever. Fantasy. People are going to, they could go on forever in the chat with stuff, but <laughs> the plane, boss, the plane. Um, okay. So uh, thank you again, Kendall. I really do appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, some people buy your book and um, which got great reviews too up there. So uh, Dave read it, right? It's back there, right? Yeah. Okay. I better get out of here. Uh, I could keep going and going, and uh, you guys need to get done. <laughs> So uh, thank you and talk to everybody later. Any last words, anybody? Sit, it was sit.